Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to our first Catalyst collaboration in the spring series. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. If you can please make sure that your phones are on silent. I'll give it a minute because I see loads of you are getting your phones. Thank you. Uh, we don't expect any fire alarms, uh, so if there is one, there is a fire exit behind you, on my right and on my left, and if we could calmly exit the building and assemble outside of the catalyst, that would be wonderful. And that's it for the housekeeping, so I will now hand you over to our speakers, Professor Martin Jones, Vice Chancellor and Chief Executive of Staffordshire University, Professor David Edrington, Locken Reg Regional Economic Development, and Mr. Simon Harris, Chief Executive of Citizen Advice, Staffordshire North and Stoke on Trent. Claudia, thank you for checking on mic. Can you all hear me okay? The mic on. In the event of fire, please also follow me. I still hold the Stoke on Trent and Staffordshire under 13 to 200 metre record. Set in Cobridge in 1982, and you had to run fast if you were in Cobridge in 1982. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to see so many people uh, here today. Hands up if you're not part of the university in any way. You're from the civic community. Probably about half this room, which is great, are members of the Stoke on Trent and Staffordshire community. I would like to applaud the fact we've got that, that, that diversity here uh, today. I want to talk about something with, with David and Simon, but can I just introduce my two colleagues to you? David, I've known you since uh, 1994 when I was doing my PhD at Manchester University. David wrote a pamphlet for the Local Government Information Unit on an innovative scheme called Job Rotation. David was working in Huddersfield at the time, worked in and out of local government, and is now having been a visiting professor, a full professor here at Staffordshire University. David, you want us to stand up? It's David. Uh, Simon is, is next to, to David. Simon is the Chief Exec of Staffordshire North and Stoke on Trent Citizens Advice. I met you, Simon, in the Hardship Commission. Did, yes. uh, Simon, uh, yeah. together the, uh, the University and the Hardship yeah. Commission have worked on three or four reports since 2021. First report uh, we did was uh, the impact on COVID, the link between COVID and benefit changes and poverty and destitution, as we called it then. That was like a COVID monitoring project. There was then a campaign about the universal credit £10. And then we did a third piece of work, which was then when the hardship crisis started to emerge uh, based on uh, turning, uh, turning, uh, turning up or down the heat, Simon, in your report. And uh, that led to the, uh, the Families on the Brink report uh, that we did uh, earlier this year. What we want to do today with you is to kind of explore a topic that uh, is challenging in terms of the link between poverty and destitution and so content, really. I'll give some introductory context to this, but what we want to do is to kind of draw on some quantitative national and local data, but also talk about local experiences on the ground of how residents are working with and struggling with the lived experience of poverty, uh, poverty in Stoke-on-Trent. And uh, Simon covers Stoke-on-Trent and North Staffordshire, because part of your uh, client group, Simon, is also Newcastle under Lyme that you referred to uh, as well. And what we want to do is to kind of raise the debate, raise the tone of the debate, to kind of begin to st talk about some of the embedded structural problems that are in the Stoke-on-Trent economy and how these are being experienced on the ground. And I think that is about kind of challenging some of the assumptions with you. But also, please see this as a genuine conversation with you as an audience in terms of a dialogue. So collectively, we'll speak for about 35, 40 minutes. We want to leave time for interaction where we can have a conversation. I would say this is being recorded uh, for YouTube uh, in the background as well, just to make you aware of that at the same time. The structure of uh, today's event will be as follow. I'll give you some brief uh, context to where we're coming from and David will come in and talk about what we think and we, I know we're using strong words but I think they're important works, words to talk about the notion of a humanitarian crisis. David will give some context to this and then Simon will flesh out on the ground by talking about some of the case studies uh, of the clients that uh, Simon's working with. This will flesh out some of the trends and dynamics that we want to talk about and then we want to talk about where next. You know, We are uh, you know, academics and practitioners and I think there's a responsibility on us and a responsibility on this university community and there's university scholars in the room, not to just come up with a critique, but to talk about what can we do about it as well. You're, you know, you're on the cusp of a possible new government coming in you know, locally and also nationally as an opportunity to inform and shape policy. So it's a genuine dialogue with all of you in the room in terms of knowing what we're going to reveal to you is what do you do about it uh, in this context. What I'm going to do at the start of this presentation is just talk about some of the want, things I want to challenge. So I'm a geographer by training, 
And there was a debate in human geography in the late 1990s about the difference between shallow and deep public policy. By talking about deep public policy, what I want to do uh, this evening with you is to think more deeply about how, how places are constituted in different ways, how to understand Stoke-on-Trent, you need to understand Staffordshire, you need to understand Staffordshire in the context of the West Midlands, you need to understand West Midlands in the context of the national economy and the national growth model that impacts in certain ways on what we see uh, in the ground on Stoke-on-Trent and Staffordshire, as Simon and David will reveal. What I'll call for this evening, I think, is a deep approach to public policy when we question the assumptions that are being made. Policymakers frame policies in certain problems, like a prescription. You know, they write certain problems in certain ways to mobilise certain solutions. It's called a construal in academic language. And I think it's right for us as academics and practitioners to challenge some of these categories of how problems on the ground are framed. Problems on the ground are framed in certain ways uh, to mobilise certain solutions. What I also want to do is to call in the room today is I'm involved in this in my day job. I'm a classic Gemini. You'll see me being a VC one minute. And on social media, I try and pitch it the other way around, saying, on the other hand, as an academic, we need to look at this as follows. What I want to call for this evening is that we can claim boosterism. Now, it's great to see cranes on the landscape around the goods yard, isn't it, in terms of the great infrastructure developments happening in Stoke-on-Trent. But I think there's a duty on us as a community to also focus on the things that you don't talk about, poverty, inequality, uneven development. Because if you don't talk about those things, you're guilty of depoliticising a lot of the things in the economy, aren't you? So boosterism comes with it, a genuine a flip side coin to question issues of poverty and inequality here. And to understand the infrastructure that's out there in levelling up, you need to understand the link between levelling up skills and employment and inequality here. It's great to talk about the economy on the one hand, but let's also talk about people's lives on how this is only one part of it. So yes, you can argue about property-led regeneration and infrastructure regeneration, but also it's about people and places, about skills, about proper working lives. And what the theme that runs through this, it's the work, academic work that I've been doing with David since probably about 1999, David, when we started to write with each other, which is to lift that debate and talk about disadvantage and uneven development. And these are difficult things that I find difficult to talk about in my day job, but I challenge, you know, the city council and national governments because it's how we as a university slot into this as well in terms of providing educational advantage uh, in a kind of left behind place, as it were. Now, why this is important, colleagues, is this next graph I'm going to show you because Stoke-on-Trent and Staffordshire are sandwiched between two metro superpowers, rather like a citadel, you know, the Manchester city region to the north and to the south the West Midlands city region, that gap in the middle. I think is really, really important. And you, you'll see, um, as you walk from here uh, to the Glebe, you know, you see that great development starting around the goods yard on the one hand. This is important that we're in this kind of, this era of, of levelling up. It's good that this is happening. But I think there's also, you know, an opportunity of how uh, the city, the Stoke-on-Trent city region, you know, presents it. So you've got the levelling up narrative from national government as context, being mirrored by the notion of powering up by Stoke City Council which is important to raise that boosterist game on the horizon here. And I want to say there are opportunities here to talk about, you know, the challenges of post-Brexit and a post-Covid economy here. But also at the same time, I would claim some caution around that. This is the Mitchell Index. You'll see this. If you Google economic growth in Stoke-on-Trent, you'll see a Mitchell report that's highlighted where Stoke-on-Trent is one of the fastest growing local economies in recent years in terms of percentages of jobs increased here. Again, you need to situate this in terms of where this number's coming from. It's a percentage. There's no debate locally, really, uh, about the quality of work, the quality of what these jobs are in, and the quality of the sector here. If, you, if I said to you, and this is what Clinton did for 20 years, he said, oh, I created 200 jobs, and one bloke said, up, put his hand up and said, yeah, I've got nine of them. So in a sense, what I'm claiming for, calling for today is a proper debate on the sustainable nature of local economic development and inclusive local economic development here. Because I think this boosterist claim for job growth needs to be situated in terms of all the points on this slide. If you look at the data, the Stoke-on-Trent economy has rebounded fast in recent years. There's a massive conundrum uh, out there in terms of low value added, low skills, what academics call low skills equilibrium, in terms of where are the jobs in the Stoke-on-Trent economy? Who are the jobs for? Is there a link between jobs and the individuals that live in the six towns? Or is it folk commuting in around travel to work areas? What about GVA, uh, gross value added, a concept that economists use here? Look at business formation rates, business survival. Look at the structure of the local economy. Think where opportunity and disadvantage here. One of the arguments that we want to 
uh, kind of introduced to you that David will cover is I think there's a structurally embedded context of the stroke and, stroke and trend economy, which the trends that Simon and David all ha will highlight are being overlaying over time here. There's a deep, deep, deep history here that it's easier for your policymaker to airbrush this away and depoliticize context and change. We want to call for a kind of a new debate on the economy here. And the context is here. Uh, I'm not going to go and foe you here. These, these are structural changes in the local economy that you've experienced, the drift away from advanced manufacturing. But what's interesting, I'd claim that anybody that calls um, so-called post-industrial doesn't actually look at the data. It's not post-industrial. The industrial's still there. Because look at that graph over time. What's interesting about this graph are the influences of the public sector, the health sector, and the university sector, but also the relatively small nature of the digital economy that's really, really important. But those shifts in time are really important. There's a classic shift from the late 1970s onward in, in terms of that shift from manufacturing to services. Manufacturing doesn't go, go completely away. It's there in the background. What's interesting, though, is look at the right-hand graph on here. Some of the trends that David will highlight are situated with an explosion in terms of the orange, the, the orange cell, in terms of temporary employment. It's what's called the zero-hour economy or contingent work. A lot of this is in certain sectors that fuels a particular dynamic in the local economy that produces precarious work over time. In a sense, that employment data from the Mitchell Index needs to be situated in terms of what kind of jobs, in what kind of sectors, for where, in terms of where people are travelling from and going to there, here. Uh, another slide that I'll show you here, which is the latest ONS data. Thank you to John Fairburn, John and the audience for highlighting this. In terms of skills data in the local economy, in terms of the proportion of individuals with qualifications level three and four and above, those individuals that went to university who, or who go to university. There's an interesting dynamic here on top of which the arguments that David and Simon will uh, outline in terms of the nature of employment, the nature of skills. Final bit of contextual information, and I'm 14 minutes in, really, is this graph here. And I see this on a daily basis if you drive up and down the A500. This is FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, by sector. Look at Stoke-on-Trent, look at the blue area in terms of distribution. It is great to see the likes of the Ceramic Valley Enterprise Zone with all the warehouses going on. If you look from the top of Wallstanton, where I link across the area, if you look towards Malcott, that entire area of logistics and distribution is really, really important. What I would question is the kind of employment that that generates in terms of sustainability, what it does to the local economy, whether it's about opportunity, opportunity for who. Those patterns are really, really important because that's how land is invested in particular forms of economic activity in the same way here. So I think we need a broader debate on uh, the wider nature of the local economy here. I'll come back to that uh, in a conclusion here. So the argument I think I'm trying to make in the first section here is to understand the next section that David will talk about, is to understand, I think, the historical basis of the Stoke-on-Trent economy, trends in employment, trends in wealth, trends in opportunity uh, and educational opportunity here. So what we call for, I think, is a wider debate on economic activity. This, I think, is a, a, a kind of a, a, an appropriate point where David will come in and talk about uh, austerity and uh, notions of a humanitarian crisis. David. All right, okay, thanks. Thanks, Martin. <coughs> <coughs> right, uh, Martin's uh, set the kind of context of... Uh, for, for my bit in, in this presentation and um, I'm, I'm sure you want to um, understand well what we need to do is understand what we mean by austerity and what we mean by uh, humanitarian crisis. Um, it, might, it might be worth actually going back to some earlier reports. We, this, this, this is a presentation from the sort of latest report we did uh, from the series of about three early reports, is that right? And um, the last, the last report, which was done last year, uh, which we did about September last year, we talked about the poverty catastrophe, and you know, strong words. And, and now we're talking about uh, a humanitarian crisis. And the reason um, we're talking about humanitarian crisis is um, basically uh, we need to kind of describe the event as it really is, and, what, and, and describe it as it really is. And, and Martin talks about how people avoid talking, um, saying what, how things are really are. Uh, so what we're trying to do is actually focus on that. And the other thing is austerity. Now, uh, what's interesting, austerity is bandied around in the media and everything, but people are not really explaining it. And uh, what, what my, uh, our analysis of austerity is, uh, well, it's, it's, it, it involves various things, but it's about actually cutting back 
uh, expenditure, and it's something that's been going on since the late 1970s, uh, which is interesting uh, since the Thatcher government and probably before 1976 and the IMF. Perhaps that was uh, the IMF policies uh, in relation to the, um, you know, the Labour government, the Healy government, uh, with uh, Dennis Healy, the Chancellor. Uh, and basically, we've had uh, consistently uh, a narrative about we can't afford public services, we can't afford uh, public expenditure. This quotation I just found, found out, uh, just kind of found before, just a couple of days ago, and slotted it into the presentation. And, and I think it, from the New Economics Foundation, I think it encapsulates uh, what, what we're talking about, really. Uh, consecutive UK chancellors have already put the country through a decade of austerity, I would say four decades of austerity, which means we know exactly how it ends. Near stagnant, stagnant earnings growth, threadbare public safety nets and a, and a stall in life expectancy. And that's, that, that last bit is really important as well in, t in relation to the health crisis. Um, right on the right side. <laughs> um, so let's talk about social security. I prefer to talk, talk, talk in terms of social security than, than benefits. I think the social security means what it means about actually um, a system which gives people security. Um, We've had the COVID crisis, and then we've had the, and now we've got the cost of living crisis. But we've we've had a cost of living crisis for a long time. Uh, it's just this is how how it's off, it's described. Uh, but in our research, we we found that uh, if you look at the numbers that are on claiming benefits, and then you look at uh, the actual amount of money people get in in benefits, um, which is again seems to be the world's best kept secret until The Guardian started publishing in the front page recently about um, people are getting about half as much as they need in terms of the keeping up with the cost of living. Uh, but benefits have been low for a very long time. Uh, it, the, this country has, has been one of the lowest um, paying in terms of generosity in, in the benefit system it, it compared with other European countries. So it's 17%, 20% of average wages, uh, and basically, it's not in, the benefits what people get are not enough for people to live on. So um, in earlier reports, we talked to uh, the food banks, and, um, and we've stopped talking to the food banks because, uh, it's, I mean, so food banks have been normalised, but in a way, um, we've asked food bank people who run the food banks, they said, well, if people, if people don't come to you, what happens? And they say, well, they'll, they, they'll go hungry or they'll starve, you know. Um, and it's like, it's like you've got a famine in this country, a food famine. And it's just that you don't have, uh, people can't afford to actually buy food. People own their, open their fridges uh, and there's nothing in the fridges. And you see... You know, there is report. There are report, plenty of reports on on uh, personal stories, and Simon will um, go into more details of people's experiences of that. So, uh, so that point is, I think, well and truly emphasised and well and truly made about uh, the social security system, the, the people, the amount of money people get in benefits. That's not just universal credit, but what we call the legacy benefits, the people on disability benefits are extremely low. Uh, quote from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, uh, people are just, a, um, people just can't afford uh, the basic essentials. That's, that's the situation in terms of the social security system, although uh, what, what's, 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 what does it mean also in terms of people in work? Of course the social security system doesn't stop in terms of people in work because 35 uh, 35% to 40% of people who are claiming universal credit are, are in work. So now the government has shifted over in terms of the welfare policies uh, as universal credit as a, as a top-up. Of course, it's incredibly mean, you know. Uh, it's really extremely low. So you're in a low-earning low job and you get, you can 
qualify for universal credit, but the amount of money you, you get or one gets in terms of universal credit and, the, and wages is still uh, woefully inadequate. And this is, this is a city, uh, this is an area like many other areas in, in, in the country, in the uh, Midlands and the North, where you have high rates of, pe high rates of people claiming um, out-of-work benefits, but out, out also um, in, in, in work benefits in, in terms of universal credit. But you also have a system um, where, well, not a system, but a labour market um, dynamics, which Martin has been talking about, about where there's a high, high proportion of people on, on low wages. And that's throughout the country. It just happens to be really concentrated in areas like Stoke-on-Trent, another what I call deindustrialized area. Uh, I don't know whether you mentioned deindustrialization, but this, this, is, this is a long-term process, actually going in before, starting from the 50s, really, but accelerated in the 1970s. So what's happened with Stoke, to, to sum up, is that Stoke and similar economies uh, have not, never really recovered from the, you know, the deindustrialization, the, the closure and the destruction of the ceramics industry, as in Stoke-on-Trent, and other uh, staple industries. And, uh, and as Martin says, the, the alternative economic scenarios have, have not sufficiently provided the prosperity. Still on the theme of austerity, uh, in, which is what we focused on in this report, is that um, childcare. I don't know whether any of you have sort of come across reports in the... Uh, the newspaper quite recently, um, Sunak had a childcare strategy which he's kind of abandoned and, and really um, upset a lot of people, even within the Conservative Party. And the CBI, Confederation of British Industry, have actually called for one, £1. £1.6 billion pounds investment in childcare. Re but this has been a lot, you know, people, people are just realising childcare costs are a problem. Uh, but it's been around for, again, around for years. Um, but, I want, but it's important to highlight it because we've got uh, now one of the most expensive childcares in the world uh, because, we have, because of the lowest subsidy. It's, again, about austerity. It, the impact of austerity is huge in terms of people's capacity and ability to work. So thus we have the title, uh, Want to Work and Can't Afford to Work. Right, um, on health, and, we, and John's in the audience, we, we have the expert on health, uh, John Fairburn. And um, what, what, what's important is the, the long-term um, uh, problems of the economy have huge impacts on health, deprivation, um, high rates of deprivation are, are related to... Um, mortality rates and so on and um, and there's been a quite a few uh, quite a few reviews the marmot review in, in 2010 but I was working I used to work in local government I was working in South Tyne council um, in the in very poor uh, urban authority in the northeast and Tyneside and when I was working we had the black review which was suppressed and then it was eventually published uh, the Black Report, which was about health inequalities, what goes around comes around. We've had these, these issues being raised constantly, but we have uh, higher rates of mortality, higher rates of problems with health, and so forth. But this is now being raised in, in, in the national political arena in terms of economic inactivity and, uh, and the fact that we've got skill shortages and labour market shortages. Right, so that's... Um, that's my kind of succinct uh, review of overview of austerity and poverty in, in Stoke, and I'll hand you over to Simon. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, right, where are we? Oh, there we go. Um, okay, I, I think. I think David has, has set the scene um, very well for what I want to do now, which is to kind of 
give you a, a flavour of how this affects real people, and in particular the people that we see um, day in, day out. And I just thought to put some of what he's saying in context, i just share um, something with you. In January of this year, we advised more people who were unable to afford to eat and needed help from food banks or other crisis support than we did in the whole of 2021. If that isn't a systemic failure of welfare policy, then I don't know what is. I think, as David demonstrated, the roots um, of, of the current cost of living crisis are, do not lie in, um, as the narrative would have it, Putin's invasion of the Ukraine, but actually goes back a lot further, and I would suggest goes back to the financial crash uh, and its consequences, namely the credit crunch, the recession, and then the political response that was austerity. It's been exacerbated along the way by welfare reform, by COVID, and now by the cost of living crisis. Um, and again, I'd, I'd entirely agree with what David said, is that you know, this cost of living crisis is nothing new. It's something that's been affecting the people we work with for many, many years. Um, and the first of these is Hamid. Um, <clears throat> Hamid's due to have an operation. He's going to be off work for three months. And he came to us because he was concerned about how he was going to manage while he was off. Um, all he would have to live on would be his SSP, statutory sick pay, because his employer doesn't pay um, contractual sick pay. And he'll get that topped up with some universal credit. Problem is, when that's all said and done, when he's paid his rent, when he's, when, when he's paid his bills, he's got 25 quid left to, to, to live on. And that one needs to cover all his uh, travel costs, not to mention his food and anything else. So depending on what his op was, and to be honest, I can't remember um, the gory details of it, um, he's likely to have additional costs as he's recovering. Um, he may need a special or more expensive diet. He may need to travel to hospital or other places for medical appointments. And he's got to do all that from 25 quid a week. And I think this demonstrates, and it's quite topical, really, because one of the stories that's around at the moment is about all these people languishing in the long-term sick who we need to get back to work, otherwise the economy is going to implode. Um, and this is how the social security system um, supports people back into work, i.e. badly. Um, Martin, this is not this Martin, I'd hasten to add. Um, as far as I know, the university vice chancellor doesn't live alone in a one-bed flat. Um, but, um, and his rent and council tax payments are currently up to date. He works 20 hours a week, um, and he's getting universal credit. And he'd, he'd very much like to earn more uh, and work more hours, but his employer um, hasn't got any hours available at the moment, or he hasn't got any hours that he's willing to give to Martin. And it is possible um, that Martin may not be at the top of the queue um, for additional hours as his employer may have. That's not really Martin's fault. That's just kind of uh, the fact of his, of his work. Unfortunately, there's nothing else he can claim. Um, as he's, as we, when we checked, he was getting everything um, that he should be. Um, and again, he's someone who's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to work, but he's struggling to make that pay. And that's a particular challenge for people in an area like Stoke. Um, He's on universal credit, and universal, credit, universal credit was designed to make it easier for people to work and easier for them to work more hours. It's meant to smooth the passage from unemployment through to full, full-time employment. Um, and, and, and to a large extent, it does. But what it can't legislate for is the availability of hours and the availability of work um, to, to provide those hours. What it has done, is, and, and the big change, was to introduce something called in-work conditionality. In the old days, if you were working and claiming benefit, then the DWP, by and large, would leave you, leave you alone to get on with it, and they'd focus on the people that weren't working. But with in-work conditionality, if your work coach um, is so minded, they can decide to um, put conditions on your benefit to, make you, to require you to seek more uh, work or better paid work, either with your employer or with a different employer. And if you don't make enough effort in their view, they can then sanction you by cutting your universal credit. Quite how that's meant to help uh, escapes me, but I'm sure um, an intellect the size of Ian Duncan Smith had thought that one through. <coughs> Moving on. Joe. 
Um, I could actually talk about Joe most of this evening, but I won't because that would get a bit dull. But Joe's case is one of several that we've seen um, emerging since last summer, and it demonstrates a collision, I think, between four different but interrelated factors. The cost of living crisis, housing law, the local housing stock, and the inadequacies of the benefit system. Joe lives in a three-bedroom property, which is, um, you know, of which 44% of the housing stock in Stoke is comprised of three-bedroom properties, and there's another 7%, I think, that are more than three-bedroom properties. And he lives in it with his daughter, just the two of them. He's working, but he's claiming universal credit on top of his wages to top that up. Um, unfortunately, his landlord's decided, probably because either their mortgage um, has gone up with interest rates rising, or because they felt they'd kind of held off during the pandemic to put the rent up, and is proposing to increase it to £600 a month. Um, Joe's kind of a bit, yeah, he's not too keen on this. So he's, he's done the right thing. He's gone to the rent tribunal. Unfortunately, in our, in our experience, the rent tribunal will say 600 quid's not an unreasonable rent for these parts. The problem he's got is that local housing allowance, which is, the, uh, which is what um, tenants of private properties um, receive to support with their rent, is set at £550 for a three-bed property. But because Joe lives in it with his daughter, he is deemed to be under-occupying the property, and that's reduced to £425 a week. And that's the maximum help he can get. As his rent's only 450 he can make up the difference at the moment, but he can't afford an extra £175 a month, particularly on top of all the other, of all the other costs um, that he's got. So what he's, he's faced with, really, is, is a really difficult situation. And there are a lot of people who are private tenants, whose landlords are now coming back to them, and perfectly legitimately and perfectly legally proposing to raise the, raise the rent, and saying to them, if you don't pay the new rent, I'll issue you with a Section 21 notice. And for those of you not familiar with the intricacies of housing law, a Section 21 notice is the no fault, um, it's the no fault uh, eviction um, route, whereby once your, the initial shorthold period of your tenancy is ended, the landlord can take you to court and repossess without having any grounds or any reason to do it. You could have been an impeccable perfect tenant, never been any trouble, always paid your rent on time, and they can still get you out. And because of the nature of this, of this piece of housing legislation, there is nothing you or the court can do to stop it, provided that the landlord follows the correct procedure. <clears throat> you may have been sat here for, for, for much of, of, of the preceding speech thinking, God, this is all a bit depressing, and we all feel a bit powerless and there's nothing we can do. Well, I'm glad to tell you, at this point, this is something that you can all go off and do and make a very small difference. Well, it could be quite a big difference, actually. Um, sitting in the pending tray at Parliament is the government's Renters' Reform Bill. The Renters' Reform Bill should address this particular issue by removing the no-fault evictions. But despite this being a, a, a manifesto pledge to introduce this bill, the government hasn't done so. So if you actually want to take a practical step, write to your MP and get them to press Michael Gove, sorry about that mental image, to introduce the Renters Reform Bill and get it into law as quickly as possible. And that would remove the no-fault eviction, Section 21 route, and, and improve the security of tenure of an awful lot of tenants. The other thing that could be done to resolve Joe's problem is to address local housing allowance. At the moment, local housing allowance, which was, designed, which was put in place, and the limit in it was put in place to prevent uh, landlords, unscrupulous landlords, ripping off the taxpayer through housing benefit. The limit is the 30th decile of the rent. So if you stacked all the rents in, in Stoke, one on top of the other, you'd be a very sad individual, but if you did, 30, at 30%, anything above that isn't covered. Anything below that is covered. So 70% of rents in Stoke are, more, are above the local housing allowance level. That's not unique to Stoke, that's the same everywhere. So what it means is that even if you are on, just on universal credit and entitled to maximum support, it will be limited to, to, a, to, a, to a very low level. Or your choice of properties 
in Stoke is limited to the cheapest 30%. And finally, Janice. Janice has similar issues to Joe, but at least she's a council tenant um, and she has more protection from eviction. The point here is that the law states that the a rate at which arrears can be deducted from UC, and that's 20%. Um, and that, in her case, is about £183 a month or £42 a week. It'll pay her rent arrears off in about nine or ten weeks, which is, you know, great for the landlord. Some respects is quite good for Janice, except for those nine or ten weeks, you probably won't be able to afford to do much else, like eat or eat a property or, or whatever. So there is, she can ask the DWP to reduce it. She can get it down to 10%. Um, but she's got to demonstrate hardship, and the landlord's got to agree. Fortunately, quite a few landlords, social landlords around here, generally speaking, will agree, and quite a few of them will actually, actually don't want the rent arrears to be recovered at 20%, but they don't have a lot of choice unless the tenant complains. It's, it's bizarre. It's a really strange ca characteristic of universal credit, but you know, so are, there are many, as I'm sure David will testify, many strange characteristics of universal credit. Um, but even if it was down to 10%, that would still be more than she could comfortably afford, but that's the minimum amount if the landlord goes for the direct deduction through universal credit um, that the DWP uh, is allowed to pay. What I think is, is bizarre in this, that the idea that anyone in that situation isn't in hardship is an interesting one. But at, any, at the rates prescribed, she'll still be in deficit, still unable to pay anything towards council tax, and is faced with a continuing impossible juggling act. And finally, what next? Well, this has been cheerful so far, hasn't it? And it's going to get that bit more cheerful in April next month. Um, when council tax goes up by 4.99%, almost everywhere except some boroughs down south where they're allowed to raise it by even more, water's going up by 7%, you know. It's not cheap pumping all that sewage into rivers, you know. Um, and council rents in Stoke are going up by 7%. And if, before anyone in the housing department, who might be here, jumps up and says, but we could have put them up by more, yes, you're absolutely correct, you could have raised them by more, but 7% is still a sizable increase for most people. In April, fuel bills will rise by 20% um, if Jeremy Hunt sticks to his current plan, which is to raise the energy price guarantee um, by that amount. It is possible, because lots of people have been arguing that he should, and the cost of, of gas is falling, um, that he might, this, he might hang on to that for the uh, next three months. Because at that point, it's anticipated that the energy price cap that Ofgem apply will be below the energy price guarantee, and that won't cost the government anything, which would be good. Um, but, at the, but if he does that, even if he leaves it at the current level, it'll still be two and a half times the winter 2021 cost. If it goes up, it'll be three times what it costs people to heat and light their homes uh, just, in, in just 18 months ago. Um, Means-tested benefits are going up by 10%. Hurrah! You know, but the cost of living support is going down by 25%. And this is a classic bit of government giving with one hand and taking away with the other. So if you take someone like, I don't know, Martin, not that one, this one, um, a single healthy person on UC, um, their UC will go up from about £335 a month to £369 a month, which is 10%. But the cost of living support they were getting will fall from, from £100 a month or £1,200 a year to £75 a month. Um, so they'll have a net increase of £9 a month um, or 2%. Not the 10%, the benefits. If you look at the two together, their incomes only go up by 2%. And that's in the context of food inflation that in January was running at 17%, with luxury items such as bread going up by 20%, milk 46%, pasta and eggs by 29%. And I think what the, these case studies and what those figures demonstrate is the fragility and the inadequacy of our social security system when faced with a crisis of this scale. And on that cheerful note, I'll hang you over, hand you over to one of you two, David, who's going to talk about inclusive economic growth. 
Right, what do we do now? <laughs> Hopefully you're not too depressed by it. I think I am. <laughs> um, right. What was interesting about the debate on um, childcare, was I was reading in The Guardian recently, um, was... Um, and and it's, what's interesting is that even the even sections of the, the Tory party are quite worried about about the problem with childcare. Just just taking that as an example about austerity, uh, because of the high costs and low subsidies, and uh, and they're calling for more investment. And and, Je and Jeremy Hunt said, "Well, we just can't afford it, right?" So we I think I think we need to. Uh, look at what's going on. Everything's about austerity. I mean, the cuts, the cuts in right across the board, uh, and you can even extend it to talking about discussing uh, climate change strategies and so forth. Um, it's all about actually public spending and the, and the narrative of affordability and debt and so forth. So that needs to be challenged. So, yeah, our first point is to challenge that. So we're calling for um, that uh, locally there should be some kind of austerity monitoring strategy um, to monitor the impact of austerity. We have the bizarre situation, is, uh, and as Martin said right at the beginning, the council have, uh, over the last two or three years, talked about powering up and promoting Stoke and investing in Stoke. And at the same time, local government, um, Stoke Council, along with a whole series of other councils in the, uh, in the de -industri what I call the deindustrialised zones, are disproportionately impacted by austerity. So you have the bizarre situation where they're, they're trying to promote investment. They're talking about them being the leaders in economic development. And at the same time, the government's cutting their budgets. I mean, just go on the web, just go on the Stoke website. Um, I was looking; I've been doing some work on Sheffield, looking at their website, site, and they're saying uh, we've got we're reaching the point where Sheffield Council are reaching the point where uh, we, you know, we can't. Uh, they, they're going to be in excess in terms of what the, the budget we're getting, so we need some budget cuts. Uh, the some some councils threatened with bankruptcy. Why is it important in terms of um, poverty and inclusive growth? Because local government, I worked in local government for 17 years, so that was my, that was my area before I became an academic. Local government is hugely important in terms of supporting people who, who are uh, disadvantaged. The, the, the poorer sections of the population rely more on local government services, and they're being cut. So to actually... Um, Talk about that. It's about a conversation of talking about things which seem to be ignored. Uh, austerity is a false uh, economy and is, and is um, damaging the economy. So we need, we need an independent economic review, uh, which is not about austerity. I think it's not, it's not difficult to argue against austerity. Uh, with uh, what, what's, Where do we rate in the wealthiest countries in the world? six or whatever so we've got all this wealth so we're talking about austerity in, in uh, impact assessment uh, ca uh, campaigning um, for investment in affordable uh, flexible childcare uh, that's something uh, we would uh, you know this is we, we put what we're trying to do is put the evidence base for uh, developing these uh, policies and political choices, political strategies, and campaigns. Uh, yeah, what we don't, um, we're talking about people's experience of, um, lived experience of poverty, or the death experience, it's actually the death experience of poverty, uh, because um, we have excessive deaths um, due to poverty in, in the areas like Stoke-on-Trent, to do with health, the problems of health related uh, poverty. So uh, obviously there's, there's a need for um, uh, talking about the NHS and actually put uh, investment in, in the health services uh, is, really, is really important because it has a direct 
relationship with actually um, addressing poverty, but also it has a direct relationship in addressing uh, something which um, quite a lot of think tanks are talking about is the, the causes of uh, high rates of economic inactivity and labour shortages and skill shortages because post-COVID there's, there's a huge cohort of n huge numbers of people who are, have got long-term health conditions who could be uh, helped into work if the health, health service and mental health service support was in place. Again, it's a, it's a link with austerity. Uh, one of the things that the government is doing is trying to solve its labour market problems through, um, or labour market shortages through a more sort of coercive, if, it can't, if it's not co so coercive so already, uh, coercive use of the um, universal credit system. So they're, they're, they're all, they've now uh, upped benefit sanctions so in Stoke-on-Trent, again, it's the best kept secret. Uh, there's now twice, four times as many people have been sanctioned on benefits as, as they were before. There was a kind of moratorium uh, during the COVID, uh, COVID crisis. Uh, <clears throat> that's because of the huge lobby from the welfare rights organizations, including CISO advice around that, but they now uh, reintroduced them. Uh, just, just read some of the, the statements from the Conservative Party about what they think of uh, claimants and then you can see why, they, why they're why pursuing that policy. Uh, and the other thing we were proposing is um, flowing from what I've just been talking about is to uh, what we've all been talking about is greater investment in, in employment support uh, which will pay, pay, pay dividends. I mean basically to actually um, if you costed some of these policies, there could be a high expenditure input, but there's also uh, you're saving on the, the, the financial costs of, Benny, uh, of poverty itself, which is about 60 odd billion pounds a year, pounds a year uh, and getting people into work. And there's also lost tax revenue. So you can do the cost benefit analysis. Uh, it does actually pay to invest. Uh, it's a social investment. Okay, over to, to you, uh, questions. There's a roving mic. <laughs> Claudia to your right and my left, uh, and there's a mic in the middle as well. Happy to take uh, questions for the remaining time. Helpful if you could just briefly introduce yourself in term, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take questions, thank you. Oh, well, hiya, this seems to be my favourite. Um, obviously I'm a resident from Newcastle, I'm obviously studying at Staffordshire, University. Obviously, the figures are very interesting. Are the figures quite similar in the borough of Newcastle compared to Stoke on Trent? And the finally, do you think is it a lack of education that is driving low paid jobs in, the, in this vicinity of, uh, of like North Staffordshire and Stoke on Trent itself? Simon can probably talk about the Newcastle okay. case to be uh, first part of that question. Simon. Yeah, I mean, I think the, yeah, the figures we've seen for. The, are broadly similar between the two, so there's not um, there's there's not as big a difference as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. um, in terms, sorry, what was the second part of your question? So yeah, no, yeah, the, that the, was just like the comparison of Newcastle under Lamb Stoke, but then kind of we're saying generalistically, obviously you, you were showing that education. Do you think it's a lack of education or poor education in the area that's actually driving low-paid jobs to come to this area? Obviously, for example, uh, Amazon. <laughs> Distribution yeah. is, that, is that what could that be a, fa a factor that is driving the, the so skills? Is it being filmed, we need to stand oh, in right. the middle of that in terms of not like Chris. Yeah. yeah, I think it. I think it's this um, conundrum that, that 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 was was mentioned earlier, in that you know there's a kind of chicken and egg really. In order to in order to attract high paid high skilled jobs into an area that is going to benefit the area other than by just increasing the traffic for com from commuting, mm -hmm. you need to have the workforce here in order to take the jobs up. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't got that here, then, then those jobs aren't going to come. And what you'll get is the jobs coming that match the skills in the workforce. So kind of you need to up the skills in the workforce to attract the jobs. Otherwise, yeah. they don't come. And that's my understanding of, 
economic development it's anyway. It's a complicated cause and effect pattern, you're right. I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot more to yeah, it. You can't is, just yeah. say yeah. it's mm. education. It is interesting. Some obviously have been born and bred, like the figures you've shown were quite, some of it was quite obvious, but like the mortality rate, and you think, well, why is that reason it's so high in, in this part of like compared to the rest of England? So I thought it was quite interesting in that sense. I think there's a definite correlation to an infant mortality and poverty. So the infant mortality rates are always higher in the poorer areas yeah. of the country. Uh, my name is Joe Cairns. I'm an ex coal miner, ex striking miner, and also heavily involved in the community of Newcastle and Lyme, as we've just said. Um, I've lived through the single regeneration budgets of the last Conservative governments. I've lived through the new. Um, Housing management pathfinders, auto regeneration uh, projects with the Labour Party. Also, we had a health study within the um, <coughs> Western urban villages regarding uh, deprivation levels, also child mortality rates. And I'm actually very concerned because the child mortality rates are even going up. The rates of mortality of the men and women are going up. And it is since the uh, deindustrialization uh, from the Conservative government through the 80s and through the 90s and through the non investments through the labour years and also through the non investments from the European government and the uh, coalfield areas, I too suffered massive losses of um, industry, career, and also within my own personal family. I actually lived the experience of the, uh, what you've been talking about. Uh, my question is, uh, I was fighting for trade union right throughout all these um, new planning and developments and all these new manufacturing. Do you think that if the companies recognise trade unions, also recognise a socialist government, and it's not a Labour government, a socialist government, that this community will be a lot better off? Thank you. They have the lowest rates of child poverty in Europe mm -hmm. and they have uh, you know higher standard of living. It's not it's not perfect. There, there are all these countries, everybody is affected by the impact of the international crisis and the cost of living. Uh, but I was there last year, I was doing some work for uh, some research at the university, and I was talking particularly to the labour market authorities and the and the trade unions. And in fact, when I talked to the trade unions I, I, and the labour market policy makers, I, I said, oh, do you have a cost of living crisis? Uh, and they said, well, what's that? Um, because they have mm -hmm. relatively generous benefits. I think they do have, the, they do have it now. So in, in short, uh, whether it's a socialist government or whatever, I think a government which, uh, has, uh, which supports strong trade unions uh, uh, is really important because it's it's the trade union. Uh, you know, most of our day-to-day -day benefits were won by the trade union movement, as far as I'm concerned. Can I just um, make one brief one brief comment? I'd, I'd wire this out. Great question, because you've lived through what's called rounds of regeneration, start off with the SRB, and then you've lived through all them schemes. I'd call for a wider social dialogue in terms of not just trade unions, but civil society and local government, Dave. You look at the inclusive model of Dem Danish economic development that David and I worked on. It's predicated on an inclusive, socially inclusive labour market, such as trade unions 
and the other social partners in a dialogue. And it's part of that foundational economy where it's more organic and locally based, but it's, it's more resilient. So I'd, I'd applaud your question in that context. There's more, more questions in the middle. I think the back there. So we are, um, we, if I can just ask that we keep the questions very brief and concise because we have to, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, mine's a little bit of a comment and a question, but I, I query the effects of Stoke and Trent Council on poverty and deprivation in this area. And I say that because Stoke City Council in 2018-2019 wiped out £5.8 million pounds and just this month, I think, wiped out again £7.4 million. Pounds. And I offer myself as a case study because... Stoke City Council, in their excellence, overpaid me, and instead of taking it back as a payment plan, today I received an eviction notice. They have made me bankrupt and are trying to make me and four children homeless. <clears throat> so I ask again, what are the effects of Stoke City Council on poverty in this area? Um, mm. Oh, okay. That's a very good question, because I think it's a difficult one to answer, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, they will, they will refer to things like powering up, they'll look at the levelling up, they'll, talk to, they'll, they'll point at all the buildings they're building and a car park they've just built for a city centre that's not exactly thriving. Um, so I think it's difficult at the moment to identify anything that they've done positive in that, in that respect. Probably time for two more, aren't you, Claudia? Yeah, two more questions. Oh, yeah, shall I go? Very much linked to the previous questions, this lady here about Stoke Council and the gentleman at the front about education. We gave back, I think, 2018-19, a million pounds. Stoke Council forfeited in apprenticeship levies that they didn't spend, so they're not making a commitment into the investment in the education themselves to model for other employers in the area. That's my point. Just wondered if you've got any thoughts on that. Yeah, right. So I would actually call for a shift from the apprenticeship levy to a growth and skills levy. There's a problem generally with the apprenticeship levy that's not just a comment about Stoke City Council. It's how it's used and utilised. It's how it's shared. I think it needs to be a wider reform. You might see this in the budget later this week. It needs to be a growth and skills levy. But I acknowledge the point in terms of how difficult it is. And it's, I think it's wrong that the money's returned. It can be re recycled in a variety of ways. One last one, I think, Claudia. Yeah, yeah so my question is for Martin. Um, so I work in business development. I know what I can do to try and help yeah. the area. What else can we do as a university? Obviously, a lot of them statistics are pr pretty horrifying. Is there anything else that we as an institution can do to try yeah. and improve the area? It's a great question. There's an onus on me, given the position I hold. And yeah, it's uh, shifting, challenging that narrative in terms of boosterism and all this stuff. It's education providing, it's promoting an educational opportunity for uh, education in a low participation area. Only 20% of school leavers in Staffordshire go through our education, go to a university at all. 17% Stoke contract is making that, that argument about investing in your future at the same time. But it also, and there are some folk in the room here, the university's involved in the MSc in entrepreneurship. It's about growing your own, you know. There is an opportunity for an entrepreneurial turn in the local economy. What we're trying to do as a university is retain graduate talent, you know, so it's not a brain drain skills leakage to make sure this is a place. But also there are 18 million people that live an hour and 10 minutes from Stoke-on-Trent. It's making out that it's the location to invest and to come in, to have those conversations, to turn the nature of the economy around. And this university is unusual in that because it'll have that argument. Most other universities won't. They're, they're just focused on other things. So this is why you know, I'm involved in this with David, who also works here, and also Simon to try and shift that narrative around here and working with partners where we can do. Uh, and that's kind of where we're pitched in that context. Um, can I just add very briefly, I think it's also about how the university spends its money and where it spends its money yeah. in order to support local businesses and the local economy. And because it, you know, it's not short of a bob or two, as this building will tell. So, I mean, if that, you know, if as much of that money can be kept locally, then it will, it will benefit the local economy and local people.
And just on that, uh, you know, out of our 15 key performance indicators, KPI 13 is about spending the local economy. We have some targets around procurement locally to keep that money in what's called the circular economy in terms of contractions. So this building, yeah, it's a £43 million building, but it used local supply. Uh, Chesterton, Thorpe Construction, with all the cladding was sourced locally. Apprenticeships were, you, were used locally. You do better. Uh, Leeds Beckett University has 60% of all expenditure kept in the local economy. Let's do better and keep those, uh, those local supply links going. Thank you very much. I'm aware that there was more questions. I'm really sorry we have run out of time. Obviously, our speakers are still here if you would like to ask them questions after the event. Thank you very much for coming. Our next uh, Catalyst collaboration will be on the 17th of April, and it will be uh, with our psychology uh, lecturers around children and their drawing during, during pandemic and their emotions and how they coped during the pandemic. So if you are signed up to our events list, you will soon get an invitation for it, and we hope to see you there. Uh, if I can just ask for a final uh, round of applause for our speakers. Thank you very much. Have a